Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 21st meeting of 2015 of the Public Petitions Committee. Uh, can I remind uh, everyone present to please uh, switch off mobile phones and uh, Blackberry's electronic equipment, please, because it does interfere with the sound system. And we go to agenda item one uh, um, to seek the committee's agreement to take agenda item four and five, which is the review of the public petitions process and the committee's work programme in private. Do the committee agree? Agreed. Before we go any further, I'll just note apologies from Angus um, McDonald because he's uh, got the flu this morning, so, and Hanzala will be here as soon as he can. And Jackson Carlos also, I had to put in his apologies. Um, that brings us to our next agenda item, which is consideration of new petitions. The first petition this morning, uh, which is in front of us, is PE1584 by Angus Files on a new Scottish Vaccine and Immunisation Advisory Committee. Uh, the members have a note from the clerk, uh, the, the petition and the SPICE briefing, the space briefing and we also have this uh, folder which has been provided to us all this morning by, by the petitioner. <laughs> Thanks very much for all of that, that information. But to get us going, if you want to take five minutes or so to introduce your petition, then we'll discuss it. Yep, Thank will you. do. Uh, thanks very much for inviting us along here. And it's a, a great showcase for... Uh, Scottish democracy, and uh, I'll just proceed if that's okay. Um, the subject of Scotland's reliance for vaccine policy and the advice of the United Kingdom's Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation, JCVI. In the brief space allocated, I would like to focus on the initial statement in Rachel Smith's letter to me on the 29th of October. Uh, quote, Scottish ministers are confident in the independence of the JCVI, end quote. I would also like to quote at the same time um, the, the chairman of uh, the Vaccine Committee, um, Andrew J. Pollard, 12th of February 2014, item 6. Um, quote, the chair explained that it was important for the committee to be independent and to be seen to be independent when providing advice to government. This means not only being separate from the influence of industry, but also um, being independent from the Department of Health as the recipient of the committee's advice. Um, if the prime reason for trusting the advice of the JCVI is that it is an independent body, then ministers must have failed to do their research, sadly. A number of its members, including the chairman, have a concerning catalogue of links to the pharmaceutical industry. Professor Pollard, the present chair, is among his other appointments head of the Oxford Vaccine Group, which owes its continuing existence to accepting contracts for research and clinical trials from pharmaceutical companies and other agencies trying to promote vaccine products. Although he states in his declaration of interest that he does not receive personal remuneration from the industry, he is the director of an enterprise which acknowledges participation in a significant number of drug trials, following on from which he has co-authored numerous papers in the on the outcomes. Very recently, he co-authored a paper in respect of trials associated with an Ebola vaccine, where he acknowledged a, quote, research grant and research report, end quote, from Janssen, the pharmaceutical company of division of Johnson & Johnson. His European Medicines Agency, EMA Declaration for 2015, however, where he has asked for details of, quote, grant funding to an institution, end quote, has no quote, interest declared, end quote. When appointed chairperson of the JCVI in October 2013, he had significant ongoing links to the pharmaceutical industry, as, quote, principal investigator, end quote, to a number of clinical trials. However, he stated ambiguously in his EMA declaration that he wasn't, quote, planning, end quote, to take on any new grants for clinical trials and research. In June of this year, his JCVI statement noted that, quote, since taking up his role with the JCVI, he no longer takes on research grants from industry and sources. End quote. This is confusing since the ZMA 2015 declaration includes a clinical trial funded by Pfizer commending, commencing in November 2013, a month after he took up office. With that background, he has now chaired the JCVI for two years. As June 2013, his ZMA declara declaration of interest indicate that he was working as, quote, principal investigator, end quote, from October 2012 for Novartis RMNB OMV NZ Bexel vaccine trial a trial which was at the time described as, quote, current, end quote, and has previously done so in a number of trials involving Bextrom meningitis B vaccine between 2008 and 2012. Under its chairmanship, the JCVI recommended the inclusion of Bextrom vaccine into the UK immunisation scheme in March 2014, having previously decided against it in July 2013, before Professor Pollard took up office. 
However, in a paper published in Clinical and Vaccine Immunology dated February 2014, which he co-authored, he has declared that he is, quote, named on patents in the field of Group B meningococcal vaccines, end quote. The JCVI revised code of practice demands that the chair, quote, cannot have any interests that have conflict, that may conflict with his or her responsibilities to JCVI, and also that the JCVI chair and subcommittee chairs cannot have interests that could conflict with the issues under consideration by the JCVI or subcommittee, <coughs> respectfully. The JCVI minutes of the meeting on 12th of February 2014, where Bex Bexra was discussed, do not include a declaration of members' uh, interests, so it is impossible to know what conflicts of interest were declared. But it is clear from the minutes that Professor Power took declarations and that members with spe specific interests were excluded from voting. This is nothing, there is nothing in the text to indicate that the chair absented himself. Five days after this meeting, uh, a clinical trial was lodged involving Bexro with Professor Pollard as, quote, principal investigator, end quote, which was partially funded by Novaritis Vaccines. It is currently described as, quote, ongoing, end quote, and not expected to terminate until December 2015. <clears throat> in June 2014, whilst chairing the JCVI and acting as principal investigator for the trial, he co-signed a, quote, study information booklet, end quote, on behalf of the Oxford Vaccine Group inviting families with children approaching routine vaccinations to participate in the Bexro trial. Its JCVI declaration of interest from June of this year acknowledges that, quote, other investigators, end quote, in his department were undertaking trials, of, uh, trials in respect of a MEN-B vaccine funded by Novaritis, which are said to have, quote, ended, end quote. There is no indication that this, this is Bexro, but if it is not, one wonders where Professor Pollard noted his involvement in the ongoing Novaritis Bexro trial not expected to conclude until December of this year. If it is the Bexro trial which is referred to, then according to the clinical trial register, it is still, quote, ongoing, end quote, and not ended, end quote, as stated in his declaration. In February 2014, the committee agreed that, quote, any conflict of interest should continue to remain for one year after it ceased, end quote. And it follows that Professor Pollard's association with Novaritis will not be expunged until December 2016. Of the remaining members of the JCVI, three have declared financial input from pharmaceutical companies to their places of employment. It follows that although they are not personally in receipt of monies paid directly from the industry, it is the case that their earnings are recovered from that source. That their employment continues is somewhat dependent on pharmaceutical companies continue to invest money in clinical trials, etc., for their products to be carried out by the, the institutions. Members have additionally benefited by advancing their careers as co authors authors of numerous publications which are published following trials. It is also critical that the Chair should be free of conflict since it is his job to appraise other members of the committee annually. Although the JCVI Code of Practice dated June 2013 at item 39 includes how, quote, minutes of each meeting will include interests that are declared and how they have been handled, end quote, only once in the past two years and seven meetings have any declarations been published, and that was on the 3rd of June 2015. It is troubling that the actions of the committee could have wider commercial and political implications. In the case of Bexra, negotiations between GlaxoSmithKline and Novartis began for the transfer of Novartis vaccines division the month after the JCVI recommended the vaccine. The government agreeing a price for the Bexra vaccine was also part of the Conservative window dressing for the recent general election. <clears throat> Ministers must surely have concerns that the recommendation circulated by the JCVI promoting the inclusion of vaccines into the immunisation schedule is not done by a committee which is entirely devoid of influence from the manufacturers. At the same time, it is hard to understand how the officials in the Department of Health and Health England could, for instance, have been completely unaware of any of Professor Pollard's entanglements. In recent years, there have been a number of serious adverse reactions uncovered following receipt of JCVI-advocated vaccines to include Panmerix and Fluenz, both of which cause narcolepsy, cataplexy in some recipient children. Cervix and Gardasil, the HPV vaccine, is now the sub subject of thousands of yellow card ADR reports of serious lasting conditions in our young women and Rotorix, with an unacceptable risk of interception of the bill, which has already been removed from the schedule in France. Fluenz place immune-compromised people and people with asthma at unnecessary risk by continuing to shed for weeks. The JCVI have an established history of permitting its members to not only hold uh, consul consultancies and shares in pharmaceutical companies, but to accept remuneration for lecturing and carrying out clinical trials spanning decades. The members are appointed by the Secretary of State via the Department of Health, Senior Responsible Officer in consultation with PHE Public Health Directorate. The subcommittee invite industry representatives to their meetings. It looks as if, it, on its own terms of reference, the JCVI has failed miserably to maintain its independence. 
It is not good enough to simply state that it is independent when there is much evidence to counter this. I respectfully submit to ministers that they should not be complicit in such practices, as an independent appointment, Professor uh, Pollard was more unqualified than the chief executive of a pharmaceutical company, being tied as he was to several of them. I therefore request that the consideration be given to the formulation of a Scottish JCVI to serve the best interests of the Scottish people. Thank you. Okay. Thank you Sorry much. for overriding there. But <laughs> Sorry, I, was, I was prepared to let you go because um, I was interested to hear the, the, the background information that you were providing, and I was listening intently to hear you know, examples of where you thought that people's association with um, pharmaceutical companies had created a situation in which either a decision had been made against a vaccine or for a vaccine directly attributable to the fact that they were uh, or had that association. Yeah. And I've got to be honest and say I didn't really hear any compelling evidence that any decision that was made was made because someone has, you know, their their job requires them to, to work in an establishment which is, has a connection to a pharmaceutical company. I can't imagine many people who would be in a position to make a judgment on a vaccine who would not at some point have to work in an academic or medical or pharmaceutical area to get an understanding of the subject matter. Therefore, how do you get the amount of ability, the understanding and knowledge of a situation if you can't be associated with the industry yeah. that, that makes the medications that, that you're discussing? Yeah, well, by their own admission, um, you know, that uh, statement I just read out there, there's three uh, people that have nothing to declare. So that means that they are completely independent. And the chairman that they've put in place there just now, and previous chairman, um, have items to declare. Uh, by their own, this is all public domain stuff. You know, it's quite easily accessible um, if you are into the, the sad subject. But um, you know, they have their own. Uh, they have three there that have nothing to declare. The chairman has interests to declare, um, so he's not the best person to be in charge of the JCVI. Um, again, um, he know, has a patent. He has a, he's patent, a patent. Uh, patent in the product, which uh, having roof formerly been refused by the JCVI, just after he becomes chairman, it becomes accepted. Now, I, I, um, uh, uh, and it's of great commer possible commercial significance because we, within a few days, uh, GSK and Novartis uh, are in negotiation for the purchase of Novartis's uh, vaccine division. Essentially, your, pet your petition is saying the JCVI can't be trusted, they're not impartial, we need our own version of that in Scotland. I mean, I've been in this place long enough to know that in terms of dealing with issues on a Scotland-wide basis, there is always the, the, the sort of in the background lurking the I can't your father kind of attitude. I mean, no one in Scotland that works in any sector um, can be devoid of knowledge or understanding of other people. Um, how on earth would Scotland be different from the current situation, given that we would be drawn from a smaller pool of people? Yeah, well, the, 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 the whole system uh, needs a, you know, a complete shake-up, you know, from the Vaccine Damage Payment Unit um, to the MRHA um, down to the JCVI, um, because quite simply, you know, we have a system here that is um, put on the trust of people that come from a scientific uh, background, but uh, quite clearly, you know, the, the, the trust has gone wide and the integrity of the uh, decisions that are being made just now is lacking big time, um, as highlighted in my speech there. Um, you know, uh, how somebody can come up and say that, you know, I have a patent and that vaccine and then introduce it to the schedule in Scotland. And to be blunt about it, I mean, that vaccine cost, I think, roughly about 27 million quid into the schedule in Scotland's NHS. Um, um, so, you know, again, we would foresee a way forward where there was independent science 
rather than the science being provided by the manufacturers of the vaccine, yeah. which is spoon-fed to people that are on the JCV that have come through the, the, the schools of pharmaceutical companies and their institutions are funded by the pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies spend a lot of money um, in you know, creating, trialling, testing um, different vaccines, medications. If those companies who are investing so much money felt that they were being treated unfairly, we'd, we'd probably have heard about that before now. Do you not think? I don't know that we would. I think that uh, it might happen that through various... Uh, they, they might bring uh, their influence to bear on members of the government uh, and we wouldn't hear anything publicly about it at all. Uh, uh, we have a quote here, actually, from the House of Commons Health Committee uh, uh, from 2005. It says the Department of Health... I think it's in your folder. The Department, the folder sorry. Yeah, the Department of Health has for too long optimistically assumed that the interests of health and industry are as one. This may reflect the fact that the department sponsors the industry as well as looking after health. The result is that the industry has been left to its own devices for too long. It may be relevant that this is the first major select committee inquiry into the pharmaceutical industry for 100 years. Anyhow, so the, 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 uh, they, they also take the task MHRA. I doubt in the uh, decade that's intervened that things have improved. The industry is by no means solely to blame for the difficulties we describe. The regulators and, are, and prescribers are also open to criticism. The regulator, the Medicines Health Care Products Regulatory Agency, has failed to adequately scrutinise licensing data and its post-marketing surveillance is inadequate. The MHRA chairman stated that trust was integral integral to effective regulation as trust with the manufacturers, but trust, while convenient, may mean that re the regulatory process is not strict enough. The organisation has been too close to the industry, a closeness underpinned by common policy objectives, agreed processes, frequent contact, contact consultation and interchange of staff. Um, so, we have... I think with the JCVI, an example of this culture. It's a can-do culture. What happens, as we know, is they review products. New products keep on being added. Nobody ever considers removing products. Uh, by now, um, a two-month-old baby gets eight vaccines in one go, including Bexero, which is not a is a vaccine with very common and quite unpleasant side effects uh, uh, which you can find even in the manufacturers uh, uh, insert information uh, so it's not necessarily uh, it might so, so the fact is that the schedule just gets longer and longer and longer. Uh, and uh, this is really obviously suits the industry. Nobody comes back and says, oh, hold on, isn't this overdoing it? And I can tell you, if nothing ever happens, the, the list of products will just go on getting longer. Um, I understand that. I mean, as I said, I'm trying to keep an eye on what your petition's asking for. And you want a separate Scottish version of the JCVI, whatever it's, it would be called. What I'm interested is in, in your take on how we would establish such a body and retain its independence. You said that there were people on the current JCVI who are not uh, associated in the way that others are with the pharmaceutical industry. Can you give me an idea of, of what is their knowledge and understanding of the area that that reassures you that they have the capacity to make the right decisions but retain an independence from Well, they're appointed companies. onto the JCVI and, um, you know, on the terms of the, the, the advertisement for the job, um, which, you know, will ask them all their credentials for that. Um, and the point is that, <clears throat> you know, these three people have said they've got no declarations. 
to declare. Um, whereas the chap that's in charge of it has, you know, you could ride a, a horse and chariot through the amount of uh, declarations he's got and uh, conflicts of interest that he's had. The, the point being as well that the JCVI only has, uh, you have to only declare 12 months of your previous employment um, of conflicts and nothing else. So you could be the head of uh, Merck or GlaxoSmithKline or whoever um, and then get yourself onto the JCVI and providing you haven't got any conflicts for the past 12 months, you are there on the JCVI dictating um, policy and immunisation to the, the children of uh, Scotland. And the point is as well, like where I come from in Argyll, um, recently, just two weeks ago there, I've noticed that uh, there was an article there um, where one in three no children in mainstream school um, require uh, classroom assistance. Um, you know, never in the history of the planet has that been the case where three, uh, one in three children require a teacher to go along with them to explain what the teacher is teaching the class. And how long can the government sustain, you know, figures and money to keep on, uh, you know, supporting the likes of uh, that sort of uh, damage? And uh, it's not all linked to vaccines, but there is a correlation. Um, as the schedule gets bigger, the more people are coming up damaged. Yeah, well, we'd we'll have to take evidence on that, but yeah, Mr Stone... To, yeah. But if I may just sort of come back to you, because uh, what Angus has said, if we look at the... is This is what the uh, uh, executive speaking on behalf of ministers told him that, that, that they were confident in the independence. I don't know... Uh, I don't know, even if we don't know how to replace this system, we, I don't know how we can have confidence in it. OK, well, up to Kenny. I mean, following on from the convener's point, I, mean, I, I did obviously hear your concerns about Professor Pollard and other members of the JCVI. What I'm not yet hearing, and perhaps we'd look for clarification of, is how would it be better, or how would the issues that you are concerned about on the pan-UK body be avoided in a Scottish body? Well, um, at the moment, <clears throat> yeah, um, once a, a vaccination is given to a child, uh, it's written down by a doctor, supposedly, into your medical file. So from there, um, we all know what doctor's handwriting is like. So, you know, you could end up with a scribble or whatever. Um, I was part of the MMR litigation um, and one of the bits of evidence that I was uh, requested was uh, the code of the vaccine given to them. I gave them the code uh, deciphered from the notes as best I could, and several other people said, yeah, that's what it says. Sent that off to Merck. Merck wrote back and said, that wasn't the MMR, that's more like a polio vaccine you were given. That's the code for a polio vaccine. So from there, um, you are, at the moment, that is what is in place. So... If you take the, the Norwegian um, example where they have a, a database where um, each vaccine is recorded in the database and to bring up a page you have to have the code of that vaccine on that data page. So um, with that it's given the code number of the, uh, the vaccine, the date of birth, your national insurance number, um, the time of day it was given and then after the vaccine you're, you're required to stay for 20 minutes in the surgery to report any reactions. Now, before you can move on to the next data page for the next vaccine, the first one has to be completed yeah, first. Systemic yeah. position to be taken by GPs. What I was asking about is the advisory council and the nature and basis of it. Well, I make a, 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 a suggestion. I think it's quite, quite a difficult issue, but one thing that seems to me to be a problem uh, is that the people who monitor the policies uh, and who are responsible for the products uh, are, are, the, uh, are the people who license the products and advocate the products 
Uh, um, so actually what we don't have, and I don't know whether it's a JCVI or what, but what we do not have uh, is monitoring which is sufficiently distant. Well, I think there's two points I've yeah. done, Chris, on that. On what basis do you think a Scottish distinctive council would be superior? And the second point is I can understand concerns about conflicts of interest, but that is why we have registers and declarations. Is it not the case that this is a very specialised field in which there are a limited number of people who have the talents and resources, and so long as they're open about any potential conflicts, it's better to have them than to have people who perhaps have no conflict, but the consequence will be they don't have any knowledge of the industry. No, um, the point is, uh, Mr McCaskill, is that the, the, the people that are actually making the decisions just now are completely tied to the pharmaceutical companies. So the system that we have just now is completely broken and needing fixed and needing changed. We, completely can't, we, cannot, about. we cannot say, whatever else, that it is independent. This, what, this is what... Uh, the, the, this is what... Uh, Rachel, uh, Smith. Rachel Smith said ministers are confident in independence uh, of the JCVI. Uh, and I, uh, frankly, it's for, I don't see where in all of this, with, with all the expertise in the world, who uh, is there minding the public interest. There's nobody governing the, um, yeah. their independence. You know, um, who does the JCVI report to themselves? You know, it's like FIFA's uh, uh, football. Not only that, you know, England, there's nobody governing. In England, they actually the, 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 the law states that the minister, that the secretary for state, should actually do what the JCVI tell him. Uh, we, and that's not your problem, but it's a, it, it is uh, an extreme situation. The, you, the, and the, the, if you argue like you have, or the, you have a problem that there's no point at which the politicians can ever say, I, they're always in the position of saying, I leave it to the scientists, I leave it to the experts, I leave it to uh, the Department of Health, uh, the MHRA, and I, I'm never in a position to question anything that they do, <laughs> because they're the experts. And I think this is quite a dangerous situation to be in. Yeah. John, John. Yes, come here. Thank you. Good morning. Just a, a couple of questions. One is, you made reference to the chair and three members of the committee having what you would consider to be interests in the pharmaceutical industry, and therefore, the, on that basis, shouldn't be allowed to sit in the committee. How many members are actually sitting on the committee at the present moment? Is that 20? I don't know, but uh, uh, we were... We, we, um, 23, I think. 23. 23. Yeah. And you've said that the... Chair and three members have declarable interests that show that they have got still got current uh, connections with the pharmaceutical industry or the, uh, the testing of drug, new drugs uh, in the system, and so that would, uh, based on your 23, then that would be 20 members of the committee who don't have a declarable interest based on your earlier statement that is older than 12 months. Yeah. So so. How I was just trying to get to the issue about why you think the chair and those three members who have got declarable interests and have declared those interests can in declare interest. The three have declared that they have no interest to declare. Right, three have declared no interest. Yeah, so, yeah. so they're, you're. They're I'm, really, I'm really. just trying to get to yeah. how many out of that 23 committee members have got have declared interests with connections with the current pharmaceutical. Well, there's only three that haven't. Yeah. The only three that so haven't. So the so the other. The rest have. 20 have got yeah, yeah. declared interest. I think it's worrying that you have a position where interests, and this often happens, are disclosed in one place and not in another place. So uh, we, 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 we know about things because they've been disclosed in, you know, to the European Medicines Agency or they've been disclosed to... Uh, in a published in, in, in a published article or something, uh, and nevertheless, 
uh, it's all right for the chairman to preside over things in which she does have a connection, or apparently, anyway. But the point I was trying to make, the convener, is trying to work out how many members are on the committee, how many members can overturn decisions and uh, make recommendations. You have indicated that the, and the current JCVI is appointed by the Secretary of State for Health uh, for England, uh, or Westminster, uh, and therefore the, all the appointments are made there. So in relation to the Secretary of State, surely the Secretary of State would have satisfied themselves on advice from their officials that these individuals would be the best place to actually sit in such oh, a committee. From, from saying that they're independent, isn't it? Uh, um, uh, uh, which, which is, uh, and clearly we're talking about the terms of reference of the JCVI itself, uh, and we're talking about uh, uh, Nolan um, uh, con conduct of, of public life. Yep. Uh, and we have an issue here where, however wonderful these people are, they don't meet the criteria. Now, you said maybe, you know, maybe people ought to think about that. Uh, it's one of the issues. Certainly, uh, I don't know what the answer is. It might be having, it might in Scotland be having a, a Scottish institution which it ha has tougher regulation. Uh, but I, I say that, you know, you, you actually have to uh, consider that the rules are not, not being adhered to. Okay. Or apparently not. Okay, convener, just to get clarification, my understanding of the uh, code of practice for the JCVI is it's, it doesn't say that they have to be independent; that the appointment is based on merit and, a, and, a, and in accordance with the code of practice for scientific advisory committees. So, the, I'm not sure where the issue about the independence comes into the debate. Uh, surely when you're appointing committees, you look to appoint experts in the field. Now, I do accept there may be seen to be a conflict of interest in terms of the appointment of the chair and the current chair of that committee that they do have direct links with ongoing trials in pharmaceutical industry. But the reality is, is that, that it doesn't say in that uh, basically the code of practice or the, the guidance notes that they have to be ind independent. I think that goes back to the point that's been made by the convener and Kenny McCaskill, that how else would you get people on such a committee making decisions if they were not, did not have experience or links to the pharmaceutical testing or industry itself? Uh, and what you've said is the, the academic interest in this area uh, would be crucial to make sure that hopefully uh, what they're doing would make sure that they were actually testing out the vaccines in a way that would, could be upheld in public. That's possible, but you have the problem uh, that the only ultimate purpose of this committee is to recommend new products. Uh, so the list just gets or, longer. Or, or, or reject. But they, they can reject products, but nevertheless, it, they don't say, well, actually, we ought, as far as we can see, but they never seem to say, we better look at some of these others and see if we can weed to some of that, because it's too much. Uh, again, well. uh, 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 this, is, this is a great bias in favour of the industry. And again, as well, like there's no actual tests for these vaccines um, together. You get your MMR. Um, none of these. Uh, that there's never been an MMR vaccine trial. There's never been the three together and a population study um, done on it. It's the same with the eight vaccines at once just now. All the vaccines have been uh, investigated independently, um, but together they've never been. Um, trialled um, and all you have is the, the car salesman rhetoric 
where these vaccines are okay, yeah, pumping them up. I'm sure there's got any relevance to, to what we're actually considering in terms of the petition because, you know, surely that's a matter for the GCVI regardless of its membership. You know, you can question whether there should or should not have been some testing of joint vaccination programmes, but that doesn't really get to the heart of, of what we're actually considering here this morning. Uh, Hanzala, do you want to ask a question? Good morning. Uh, Chair, um, GCVI's board is being questioned, or its integrity is being questioned, um, and I think that's a very serious ch charge, uh, particularly when we're suggesting that there are people on the board who potentially have a conflict of interest, a financial one in particular. Um, yeah, declaration or, or non-declaration isn't the issue. The issue really is that there are people on the board who do clearly have a conflict of financial conflict of interest. Um, that concerns me. I don't care how expert they are and you know, how many few experts are out there, but uh, when people have a financial interest, um, I have to say that I feel very uncomfortable with that. So that needs to be addressed somehow. I think that's a legitimate concern. What we're trying to do is establish exactly the merits of the petition because the petition asks for a couple of specific things. A, a, a Scottish version, uh, and therefore I'm asking how we would avoid the pitfalls that you've identified in terms of conflicts of interest and how we would do that uh, in a Scottish environment and still be able to maintain the level of expertise that's required. Yeah. That, that's my concern about what you're asking for. Uh, David, do you want to ask a question? I was just to follow on from the convener and Kenny McCaskill, you never really answered the question, because this is such a specialised field, mm -hmm. how are we going to find the people in Scotland who have the skills to take this forward um, and not have done clinical trials at some time in their past or connected to pharmaceutical companies? I'm not saying that. The, the point is that there are independent scientists out there who are excommunicated, so to speak, from the science uh, departments these days where they have differing uh, opinions on uh, the tests that have been carried out um, to date. So these people are ostracised from the scientific uh, um, hierarchy of, the, uh, uh, of Westminster and such like. So their opinions are never asked for. Um, again, you know, there needs to be a, a lot more openness and the integrity needs to be established back into the JCVI. I'm not saying do away with it, um, but the integrity of it is uh, gaping. You know, there's just nothing there. Again, I mean, I can't go into. I could go into the specifics if you if you want to to say well what what sort of body we we, uh, we require. It's quite a lot of information which yeah. we, we we all take on board. We we, we don't dismiss any information uh -huh. no, that's no, brought no, to no. us. Hansala. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering whether petition petitioners would be satisfied if GCVI could actually satisfy us all that the board does not have anybody on it that has a financial interest, rather than creating one for Scotland separately. And the point is as well that they only have to declare 12 months. So, yeah. you know, like their previous yeah. careers, maybe they don't the have rule, to declare. Maybe the rules. I to follow up because rules, rules uh, it struck me, are you aware of any other um, boards where appointments are made with, with that kind of restriction, have you any evidence that boards that relate to other, even you know, medical matters, um, have similar strictures placed on them and, and how do they work? No, I'm not aware of any. I mean, if you've got any conflicts and if you're biased in any way, if you've got any financial interest in it, I don't think um, anybody would have you there. Um, for the likes of, to put it into a small context, one vaccine and you're talking the smallest, whatever vaccine it is, if you've got a patent in that one vaccine, you know, the, yeah. the science of it, if you've got the patent in one small part of that vaccine, whether it be the preservative or whether it be the virus or whatever, um, it's like winning the lottery every week. You wouldn't be filling in a lottery ticket, you know. Uh, that's the money that's involved in it because these vaccines are uh, worldwide. And to put it into context, the likes of uh, in America, <clears throat> where... Um, Congress has lobbied quite openly um, over, uh, you know, vaccine. The pharmaceutical company is the biggest um, sponsor of uh, lobbying. 
it is and three, the media and the media, and it's three times bigger than its nearest nearest competitor. Its nearest competitor is uh, gas and oil. So that just puts that into context roughly, you know, the money that's involved in pharmaceuticals. But can I, just to go back to what I, I think the question may have been, uh, I don't know the the answer. What I do know is that the um, condition, for instance, disclo disclosure when you're uh, writing for journals has varied. It used to be a few years ago, five years, a five-year gap not for, for, for it not to be disclosed, then it was reduced to three. Sometimes the, 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 the criteria are, uh, are, are, are weakened. I wouldn't say that, that one could be very necessarily very happy with any... One would have to look at the criteria and say what criteria would be satisfactory to guard the public interest. And I don't... I, uh, I think maybe you'd have to... You, you, people would have to look who had a sort of, uh, maybe people who were more maybe people who were more concerned with the institutions than than with the science might have to answer this question because uh, in the end th these are these are institutional questions we're told the institutions uh, independent or something and mostly they're not and mostly it's quite difficult to do anything about it but one would have to say look what do we create which could make this a little bit more wholesome. That's what we've got to take into consideration. Um, I'll open it to colleagues to make suggestions how we take the petition forward because I think petitioners have raised a few issues that, that you know require some um, examination. Um, I think we we certainly have to write to the GCVI and ask them to comment on the, the concerns that have been raised this morning, and, and obviously the Scottish government to ask them what their view is of the, the current situation and whether um, an independent. Um, separate Scottish JCVI would, or, or similar type body uh, would, would have any merit from their perspective? We'll open up to other colleagues. Who... Okay. We, uh, it might be worth checking with the Commissioner for Public Appointments in England and Wales about the practices. I think that seems a sensible view given the suggestions about year criteria or whatever, whether they feel it meets their requirements. Yeah. I think the problem that's already been done. You know, and the JCVI is part of uh, uh, of that system, which is left to self-governance, and the, the self-governance does doesn't obviously work. Um, where the departments down in England are taking no notice of what is going on. You know, these problems are raised, but yes, there's nobody not actually. Not a bad idea. It's a very draw, good idea. Draw, draw, to, draw it to their attention. But at the same time. Much, Mr. Stone, for, for making that point because I was going to make the point that the committee want to understand this thing, so I think we need to write to them. So trying to talk us out of doing that is probably not in your best interest, Mr. Files. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. That, we'll, we'll take the issue for John. You want? Given that the Secretary for Health is responsible for the appointment to the JCVI, I think it might be useful to write to the Secretary of State, uh, making aware of the petition and issues raised within the petition, because there is a an issue about public transparency in terms of appointments, uh, and if the Secretary of State is responsible for those appointments, then I think we should give uh, Secretary of State an opportunity to respond to the issues raised. I think so. Yeah. Maybe, maybe Is that? Uh, Minister as well, to, uh, to see if anything's been brought to their attention and whether they're looking into it. We should write to the Scottish Government, so it would be the Health Minister who would take that with us. Yeah. Okay, so we'll. we'll Make contact with those bodies and, and we'll collate that information back and, and get back to you with the responses that we receive and, and see how we take the petition forward from that point. Appreciate it. Thank okay, you thanks for coming before us this morning. I'll, sus I'll suspend for a few minutes till we change over witnesses.
The petition this morning is PE1589 by Stuart Curry on an independent review of child contact and financial provision post separation. Again, members have a note from the clerks. They have the petition, spike briefing, and a submission from Families Need Fathers Scotland. So I welcome the petitioner, Stuart Curry, to the meeting this morning and invite you to make some opening comments before we discuss the issue. Over to you, Mr Curry. Thank you for allowing me to bring my petition before you today. As I have stated in the petition summary, I believe an independent review would be an effective way of ensuring post-separation child contact and finances are fully investigated and as many organisations and stakeholders as possible involved in the process. Whilst it would have been easy to highlight one or two problematic areas, I feel a more detailed study of the current situation would help to create a clearer and more balanced picture of how families are affected post-separation and hopefully lead to positive changes. I have already highlighted how engaging directly with organisations such as the National Records of Scotland helped and that sensitive information relating to divorce cases is no longer going to be available to the general public. This is only one of a wide range of organisations or groups potentially involved during a divorce. The Growing Up in Scotland report 2013 mentioned already highlights that non-resident parenthood is considerable, so it is important that the issues surrounding people in these situations are dealt with in as effective a way as possible in order to help stabilise families as soon as practically possible post-separation. I feel this can be achieved when things are looked at holistically. You can see that my petition highlights a wide range of issues, including effectiveness and length of negotiations post-separation, health, finances and legislation. All of these can impact upon mental, emotional and physical well-being of parents and children. Family cases are currently very expensive in Scotland. Legislation suggests that the best interests of children are paramount and so they should be. However, determining what is best for a child can take a very long time when negotiations are difficult and lengthy. For cases that proceed to court, I believe engaging parties in a significant way at specialist family courts would help to reach a suitable conclusion for a significant number of cases and may well assist in halting unhelpful correspondence between lawyers. Having specialist family sheriffs is regrettably currently not the norm and people need to be involved more at these times. The fact that there are many pathways that can be taken with none guaranteed to lead to a satisfactory outcome means that it can be very difficult for people to determine the best course of action to take. Should they go to a lawyer, should they attend mediation or court? With this in mind, signposting to services that could assist is vital, along with easier access to information. Unfortunately, some services, such as the Scottish Child Law Centre, are currently stretched. If services such as these were better resourced, then possibly many cases would not need to proceed to costly court cases. Children spend a significant amount of their time at school and attending youth clubs, so it is also important that guidelines are provided for education authorities and other voluntary organisations and bodies to assist them in ensuring they are acting within the law and are informing and involving both parents as is appropriate. Instances documented have shown that some schools have been excluding non-resident parents. This may be well be a result of ignorance in relation to the legal position. However, it is unacceptable nonetheless and could be addressed through training and guidelines for staff and volunteers. In conclusion, there are many issues to deal with for separated people and children are often a major concern. I would urge the committee to consider my recommendations as they are submitted with a genuine desire to help improve the lives for all parties post-separation. Yeah, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr Curry, for your, um, your petition this morning. And the, the contribution from Families Need Fathers. I don't know if you're involved with them as an, an organisation. I've spoken to them. Spoken to them. You're not yeah, part, you're not, not here I'm not representing part them. of the group, no. Not that that matters, I'm no, just wondering. No. Um, but they, they make the point that there are a number of areas that, that are coming together here. We're dealing with a, a variety of petitions at the minute in, in relation to these types of uh, issue. How widespread a problem do you believe this is in terms of just the specific issue that you've mm -hmm. identified? I mean, have you yeah. got any statistical information that can back this up or is well, it just something that, that you've encountered but you're not particularly aware of, of a wider uh -huh. I've read a lot of things um, e.g. for instance on the internet I've read reports on the internet I haven't got all the, all the specific details of the reports here but 
I've read widely on the internet about people, you know, finding it particularly difficult to access information and to know what to do in legal positions. You know, people, they can go to court, they can spend an awful lot of money in a case, but then once the case is concluded, issues can arise in the future. They have to then maybe go back to court. It can then cost them another an awful lot of money. Um, as I say, I've, I've read on it myself. I've also kind of contacted um, the Scottish Child Law Centre and I've attended courses they've run through my workplace, so I'm kind of aware of them in that way. And I've actually spoken to them and have found out that they are pretty stretched and they have got lawyers there who are be able to give people advice and possibly I think things like that would be helpful. I mean, people are going to doctors, they're attending community centres, so I think this sort of signposting thing is a major one, you know, what do people do? Is the first thing they've got to do, you know, think I need to go to a lawyer? Well, which lawyer do I go to? How long does it take? It's all pretty complex and the whole procedure for people is it's a traumatic time in their lives, you know, it's not a, an easy time for people and yeah, some people may well be able to um, sort things out relatively quickly, but for others it's not that way. I mean, I have spoken to people in the legal profession and I've kind of highlighted in here that it can take a year and that's kind of commonplace for it to take a year going to court and in some things that maybe isn't a particularly long period of time. But when children are maybe not seeing one parent or the other, or their, their whole routine's disrupted, you know, and people's emotions are running high, and that can cause huge issues. For I was going to be my, my follow-up question, just how do you think adversely this impacts on the children? Because obviously the situation in which you yeah. find yourself as, a, as an adult relationship, um, but it would have an impact on any children involved, uh, how big an impact do you think dragging court cases out, having... You know, even in, in the, the, the best of circumstances, there's still people coming together in a court, which is yeah. not a, a, yeah. a, a nice scenario. Children, all, children are aware of things. Yeah. They're always going to be aware of things. I work with, with children as part of my job. And, um, you know, it's major because they talk about things to people. Um, and they raise it with people at different times, their issues and their concerns about things. And I think, you know, particularly just now in education, which is the area I work in, um, we think about gear effect and we think about all what we're trying to promote in our children, resilience and um, making them have the effect of contributors, responsible citizens and well-rounded people that we want to give them the best start in life and undoubtedly people will continue to be separated, they'll be divorced, that's going to happen but um, we want to give the children the best start and make sure that their, their relationships with both parents aren't ripped for too long a time and that is the problem with the current situation. There doesn't seem to be a, a time frame for things. Things can just be as long as they take. Um, and that can have well, many, many people contributing to why that can take a long time. And you know, we, can also, we can often say, you know, one party can be more difficult than another. That's not for me to kind of make that judgment about people. But um, that's certainly not going to help the children. And I think, you know, particularly in these cases, People need to be proactive. You know, if you're going to someone for assistance, if you're going to an organisation for assistance, you're really needing help. You're needing those people to set some sort of targets in place and assist folk in that manner. Um, and I say, I do see it as a very wide area. I mean, the, the likes of one of the things I highlighted there was a personal example of having to atten attend the National Records of Scotland and find out about my own situation, which was a huge amount of information which was published publicly. And I had to put a stop to that. Um, I was quite concerned that that was available, given my job and given the children that I work with and given my desire for to do the best things for children. And that's why I had to take it up with the Scottish Court Service. But I think, you know, that's just one example of the stumbling blocks that people find themselves facing. And you think, you know, there's an awful lot to consider. There's a lot of things people need to face. But I think administrative things could be tightened up there could be tighter time frames putting things and obviously what is published to people just walking in off the street that can pay money and access things has got to be changed. I was quite starkly um, shocked when I found out the kind of things that you know that they can publish for people to read. Um, but as I say, you know, it's it's a wide, wide area. People are out there to help, but it's very disjointed, I feel, at the moment. Another kind of area which I've kind of come across legislation-wise is 
the involvement of the Scottish Legal Aid Board in these situations because they have got their own legislation which they use um, in cases, but they've got their civil, um, their legal aid uh, laws, and there's also family laws within Scotland, and that can cause issues as well when you're going through these divorces and things because lawyers are kind of working to sort of two lots of guidelines. And based on speaking to various lawyers, I've found out that it's actually not particularly easy at times to determine what the Legal Aid Board's financial clawback and rules are. They have got booklets, they have got guidelines, but to read that and to understand it um, as a layperson and also as lawyers, as lawyers have told me, is not the easiest thing to do. So that obviously makes negotiating hard. If they're kind of putting your people on a certain pathway in order to try and resolve their finances, but the Legal Aid Board's got other um, rules which are in place, they're, you know, they're law, but there's a bit of a, an issue there in trying to marry the two together, and that can again lengthen cases. Hands uh, Thank you, Convener, and good morning. Uh, Convener, you're absolutely right. Um, th there's a number of uh, petitions in front of us. Uh, people have different aspects of this particular area that's troublesome. I, I have had first-hand experience where I have seen families split up and then I've seen the children suffer as a result of that. I've even seen um, in-laws coaching children, uh, uh, which is not only detrimental, but I think quite cruel uh, because they're, they're denying a child one parent or another. And I think um, it's absolutely crucial that if there is a separation that we have mm. benchmarks of how quickly things have to turn around, particularly in the interest of the child. I think children um, shouldn't have to suffer the indignity of being separated from one parent or another um, unless there's something can be proven in, in court uh, because accusations become fast and furious and quite outrageous accusations. Um, so um, I, I agree with the petitioner and petitioners who've, who've come to us, and I think that if the petitioners are, are happy, perhaps we could put them t all together and so that we can actually ask the government to look at this more seriously, because so, I believe the social work have a very important role in this, because when children are involved, uh, I would like to see the social work department get involved fairly quickly, rapidly, in the best interest of children, and uh, that happens and that's established. Um, and then um, if the parents aren't in a position to bring their grievances to an end, then at least the children's interests could be looked at far sooner than that. And th I think that's very important. Yeah, well, I do agree with uh, uh, Hanzala Malik's point that um, we have two life petitions at the moment dealing with other aspects of family law, um, but brought by fathers who have, who have been affected by um, their, their experiences of the, the system um, and I think we do have to look at all these in the round um, of course we're, we'll look at your own individual specific issue but I think if we take an overview by conjoining the, the three petitions we'll get a, a fuller picture and I think we are building up a picture here of, of areas in which I think we would like to see the government answering in terms of family law at the present time but um, Kenny, do you want to ask a question? I would concur with yourself. I have no question to make the point that I actually concur with that. I think bringing it all together, I think Mr Curry's made valid points. I do think we're at a juncture where we have moved on considerably from previous investigations, both in this parliament and indeed legislative change. But we now have a change to the court system. We have a change to the appointment and specialisation in the Shrevo bench. Uh, we have pressures upon the Legal Aid Board, but there are changes happening there. There's changes even to benefits, and that opens up opportunities, whether we stay as we are or uh, go back to previous positions that existed or whatever. So I do think this is a juncture at which the government should be seeking to try and bring it all together, rather than looking at any one bit individually, because these things, I think, as Mr Curry's correctly said, do come together. So rather than looking at contact or looking at, you know, uh, uh, child benefit or whatever else, I think this is a time when the government should be perhaps asked if it is their intention to seek to try and bring the current changes together and consider where we go, because there's there's clearly issues across this whole spectrum. No other 
comments from committee members. As I said, I think you, you can tell that there is a degree of sympathy for the issue that you've brought. So we'll take this issue forward to the Scottish Government um, to ask them to comment, but we will make the point that we think there is you know, an emergence here of a, a concern that there may be aspects of the law that have to be looked at in, in the round um, so that we can get the best system possible. Because if we are taking the interests of the child into account, then we have to get it right for them. Um, and I think the, the points that you've made this morning are very valid in terms of the duration of court cases and the impact that that can have when, when things are being dragged out. So um, we'll write to the government and we'll get back to you once we've had that response and you'll see how we take forward the petition from that point. But thanks very much, Mr Curry, for, much for coming Thank before you. us Thank this you. morning. Thank thanks. You. Okay, again, I'll suspend for a couple of minutes to we change over. Our next new petition this morning, um, PE1579 by Jean Hepburn on funding for the new Barhead High School, brings us to a situation we don't find ourselves in very often. That uh, We had published this, it was a petition that was coming forward and would have been discussed this morning, but given that the issue that led to the petition being brought to the Parliament has been resolved and the, the, uh, the school is in the programme for the new uh, hub funding, then the issue has been resolved and there's nothing else that we can do with it. So we'll open the petition and close it if, if members agree. Okay. okay, that brings us to agenda item three, consideration of continued petitions. Uh, the next item, uh, the next, sorry, the first of those is PE1480 by Amanda Capel on behalf of Frank Capel Al Alzheimer's Awareness Campaign on Alzheimer's and Dementia Awareness and Jeff Adamson on behalf of Scotland Against the Care Tax on abolition of non-residential social care charges for older and disabled people. The members have a note on the committee's previous consideration of the petition and submissions from the Scottish Government and both petitioners. Um, in opening this up, I, I have to say, I, I, I see what the government are saying about the, the work that Professor Bell did, but there are other work out there in relation to the, the, the care tax and these charges and I think this figure of three hundred million pounds I'm sure Professor Bell didn't pick it out of thin air, but I'm not entirely sure it relates exactly to the issue that we are talking about. If, if you collect information on one subject it doesn't necessarily mean that it's relevant to the, the specifics of another. So I would like to go back if not directly to Professor Bell, certainly the government to ask just what the, the basis of that figure is, because I think there are questions. I mean, we've seen information from Scotland Against the Care Tax in particular, and I've spoken to that organisation on a, a regular basis, and, and I think that the figures that we're talking about here are, are quite wide of the mark in terms of what they're specifically asking for in relation to this petition. The three, I'm, I'm, as I said, I'm not querying the fact that Professor Bell produced a figure of £300 million, pounds, but I'm not entirely sure it relates specifically to this issue. And therefore, for it to be used as the basis on which to respond to this petition, I think, is questionable. And I don't know if, if colleagues have got other comments on, on the information that we have. No, we need clarification, clarification about this, as I said. It's, the, the disparity in the figures uh, is, is quite... I, mean, I know we, we always get, you know, Cosla and others chipping in with statistics, and we can always... Uh, see best case scenarios and worst case scenarios, but very seldom do I see a, f a, a, a series of figures which are so divergent that, that you can say that the, the thing would be so wide that it could be as little as 14 million or as much as 300 million. Something doesn't add up when it comes to these statistics. I'm not sure that the figures that we're using are, are absolutely relevant to the point that's been made, and I'd like to get some clarification around this. David? Convener, I think we should definitely write to Professor Bell to see what criteria he's using and how he's come about his figures. 
because as you say, there's a wide difference between the two sets of uh, costs. So I would like the committee to do that. Yeah, members appear to agree with that. I mean, I think we, we have to continue to ask this question. So we'll, we'll do that and take the petition forward in that way at the moment and bring it back at a later date. So our next petition then is PE1549 by Alan Clark Young on concessionary travel passes for war veterans. Members have a note on the committee's previous consideration of the petition and submissions from Transport for London and the petitioner. Um, the response we got from Transport for London was seen by the petitioner. Um, the, I think the petitioner has identified a number of questions that relate to that. I mean, I don't think we ever believed that we could look at the situation in London and say that that's exactly how, what the, the petitioner is asking for here. But I think there are things about eligibility and, and the other areas that I think he's rightly identified that we could go back to Transport for London and ask them to get a bit more information about so that, you know, we, we know that we're comparing apples and oranges, but that doesn't mean that we can't learn from what uh, trans the Transport for London are doing with their Oyster Cab to see whether it relates to the transport, the concessionary travel scheme here um, before we, we consider the issue further. So the members agree that we, we go back with those questions? Agreed. Okay. Our uh, next petition is PE1551 by Scott Pattinson on mandatory reporting of child abuse. Members have uh, reports on the previous consideration uh, in front of them and a submission from the Scottish Government and the petitioner. Open up to the members to discuss this. Inquiry with the UK Government, given the commitments by the Prime Minister about where they are taking it, I appreciate it. at a Scottish level these things can be, you know, double edged and there's views about who's concerned, but it might be interesting just to know where the UK government's going. Other than that, I would be inclined not to venture uh, in terms of legislative change given the the potential, you know, uh, consequences that are, uh, you know, un would be unhelpful and uh, potentially dangerous. I don't think we should close it at the minute. I, I do agree with Kenny. We should at least get this, the UK government's position on this so that we, we know that we're making a decision with the full information available to us. Yep. Our next petition is PE1554 by Jack Kelly on behalf of Leonard Cheshire Disability on improving the provision of disabled friendly housing. Again, members have a note from the, the, on the committee's previous consideration of the petition and submissions from the Scottish Government and the petitioner. Over to members. Well, we can. I mean, it's not what the petitioner sought, but uh, equally, we've gone to those who have interest in it. Uh, to some extent, it seems to me, as we approach an election period, it's for people to raise the issue and seek to make it a, do you say, an action matter of public policy. Uh, beyond that, I don't think there's anything we can do than, than actually send letters that wouldn't yeah. take it anywhere from. Well, I think there is a degree of understanding of this petition. I certainly support. The, the intention behind the petition is how we get um, a, into a situation that, that delivers on what the petitioner is asking for. I mean, I, I personally believe that we should be building houses that are fit for disabled people. Um, we have to make that, that commitment. Um, but I don't think we're going to achieve it by this petition, by taking it for any further forward. Uh, we just have to, as individual MSPs, support the the, the petition's uh, intention so that we can get these types of issues addressed by um, by political parties to ensure that they are party policies. There, there was a debate in Parliament in regards to um, the lack of housing in Scotland today and the type of housing. And uh, it was a members' debate, in fact. And um, one of the issues raised in that was that the size of rooms was very small, was, they were inadequate, and large houses were missing, and um, there was a, a suggestion that the government should consider um, having percentages that, uh, how many, what percentages of how should be there. And this is a, that, the type of thing that could also be considered, that we have a minimum percentage of houses which are specifically designed and uh, adaptations put in place which are user-friendly for people with disabilities. Um, 
so I think it may, may be uh, worthy of going back to the the government to say um, have they had any more um, thought on this in this area because um, end of the day there are citizens out there who do need these facilities and to try to um, uh, redesign houses is an expensive way of doing things whereas if we had something built in uh, in, in terms of what percentages people are expected to adhere to, um, it could become government policy. So I think it's a good petition, and I think we should. I, I don't disagree with it, Hansala. As a good petition, it raises a, a, a very important subject, and it was Alex Johnson's debate uh, in the, the, the Parliament a, a few weeks ago um, that, that raised the issue of the size of rooms, and you know, so there was a lot of discussion at the point, and the minister did respond to that. I think the point that, that Kenny made, and I think I tend to agree with, is that we're at the point now that we know what the Scottish Government's view is on, on the issue. I think this is an issue that, should, that we as individuals and in support of organisations like Leonard Cheshire um, should try and make party policies so that, that we can get the changes, because that's the way that change will come about. We've had the Government's response to it. We're not going to get a different answer to that, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, we just have to take our own view uh, as to whether that's an acceptable answer or in a more positive vein, what do we want to do to address the concerns that Leonard Cheshire are making? Do we, do we have any information in regards to um, how many houses we would require annually for people with disabilities? Because for any political party to take up the case, they would need that sort of evidence, wouldn't they? Yeah, I think there are... Uh, there are organisations out there that have an idea, I don't know, that I, I can remember off the top of my head, the figure of one in ten new builds is the one that's sticking with me at the minute, but I'm not entirely sure that's that's a, a general consensus uh, amongst the, the organisations, but I certainly know that, that there is some belief that, that we should... Ah, yeah, there is a, a, a note in the, the briefing paper that gives some indication of the figure. So there are indications out there. There are organisations that have uh, produced an analysis of what will be uh, needed in future. So it's up to us to, to look to see whether we can get those uh, issues brought forward. We've got to deal with the petition and whether we can take the petition any further forward. And I think that's the point that Kenny was making. We've, we've established the government's position on it. Uh, it's not the outcome I don't think that the petitioners wanted, but sometimes we have to accept that we've exhausted the questions that we can ask of the government. It falls on the rest of us if we're not happy with that response to do something about it. But the government has that position because when we clearly know that there's a need out there, I think the government is morally obliged to then try to get, uh, reduce that gap. Yeah. So John, you wanted to make a point? Yeah, can we two things. One is the response from uh, the minister in relation to the letter. Uh, it, he's given to the committee, uh, he has made reference to the local housing and planning authorities that are responsible for assessing all housing requirements in their area, planning to meet those through their local housing strategies and local development plans. Now, the issue for me is that how are these, you know, the local development plans and the local housing strategies, how accountable are these in terms of the local authorities? Because it's fine to say that though the local authorities are responsible for delivering those. But how do we check that they are delivering on those strategies? Uh, and we have had some discussion previously where uh, there are, are some disability groups who feel greater consultation at a local level may actually help uh, deliver the needs that are required and identify the needs at the local development planning stage. Because the, I know that and one of the local authorities that I represent, North Lancashire, is about to go through its local development plan. Now, I'm not sure whether the local authority will consult disability groups or uh, look at the stats in relation to the number of houses that would be required, that one in ten figure that you used earlier. So I would be keen to write back to the minister to ask exactly how those local development plans are tested and how the, because at the end of the day, local development plans are approved by ministers, and it would be useful to find out how the, the ministers actually test against 
the demand that we think there is out there and uh, whether or not they can actually local authorities show the demand levels that would be required because I'm keen I think like everybody on the committee to make sure that this is, doesn't just become the responsibility for social landlords or those in the housing association and housing cooperative sector that this should become a responsibility and an onus on all house developers uh, and unfortunately too often we find that the local authority or the social landlord the housing association are the ones who are left picking up the tap for the disabled adaptations or building appropriate housing uh, that would suit people with disability issues so it might be i'm trying to put a wee play in here that right to the minister to just get clarification on how they would test that local authorities are actually including those issues within the local development plan and the, the housing demand uh, side of things in relation to the, the future developments. I, I take that point on board, John. That's a, a good question. Uh, I don't think it's going to change the outcome of the petition, but we can certainly establish just how the, the government can do that. Um, so I'm more than happy to, to keep the petition open until we get that answer. That's fine. Okay. Uh, next petition, PE1563 by Doreen Goldie on behalf of Havenbridge and Stanburn Community Council on sewage sludge spreading. Again, members have a note from the committee um, on previous consideration of the petition and submissions from the Scottish Government, SEPA and the petitioner. So, what do members think, Kenny? Pushing the Government a bit more, I think this has been a long-standing issue since this Parliament was re-established and, uh, you know, I think both the petitioners and the deed ourselves are entitled to know what's happening and what's going on, so I think pushing them would be useful. To go back to the government on this one, yeah. Was a good John. Yeah. I think we also need to be pushing SEPA as well, uh, because I, I, while I welcome the response from SEPA and they actually detail the number of organisations that I currently have, I, you know, I think they've got talked about operating sludge production and treatment facilities. Uh, they also indicate the list above does not include details of, and what I'm particularly concerned in three bullet points have indicated, as companies involved in alternative end uses of sludge, such as incineration or landfill. Uh, and I know landfill in my area is a particular issue, uh, where you know, the licenses for landfill dumping of uh, sewage uh, as a concern to residents and others, as well as the residents that, uh, from the Avonbridge area that have raised the petition initially, there is a concern that you know, there's what some would describe as indiscriminate landfill uh, usage in, or dumping in sludge. And it would be useful to try and get some indication of how widespread the use of the you know, landfill dumping is in Scotland and in how close, what proximity these are to residential areas, uh, because I think that is a, an issue that uh, may come back to uh, haunt us if we don't start trying to, trying to deal with that issue as well. Yeah, happy that we go back to see with those questions, John, if everyone else has agreed. Yeah, okay. Next petition, PE1565 by James Dougal and the whole of life sentences for violent reoffenders. Um, members have notes on the petition so far and the submission from the Lord Justice Clarks. What do we think we need to do with this? I'd be minded to close it on the basis it's gone to the Sentencing Council. If the petitioner doesn't like the Sentencing Council's view on it, then it's a matter of public policy, as we were saying, regarding previous matters, and it may very well form part of various parties' law and order manifestos for the 2016 election, but uh, it does seem to me that the sentencing council is placed to go and either it satisfies them or it doesn't, and if it doesn't, then I think by the time it came back here, all we'd be doing is saying it's an election issue. Yep. Okay, yeah. I'm going to agree then. Uh, Next petition, PE1566 by Mary Hemphill and Ian Reid on a national service delivery model for warfarin patients. Again, members have paperwork in front of them on the previous consideration of the petition and submissions from the University of Birmingham, the petitioners and Dr David Patterson. I think this is one we need to go back to the government to get information on 
the Healthcare Improvement Scotland's guidelines on self-testing and ask whether the Scottish Government would commit to consulting with the petitioner and the NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde uh, in evaluating the efficacy of the local self-management service delivery model that they've developed together. We need to find out what we think of it. Members agreed? Agreed. The next one is PE 1568 by Catherine Hughes on funding, access and promotion of NHS Centre for Integrative Care. Members of a note from the Committee's previous consideration of the petition and submissions from a number of NHS boards, the Scottish Government and the petitioner. Members should note that the petitioner submitted an additional submission and that has been circulated and put on members' desks this morning. Before I come in this morning, I received an email from Dr Jacqueline Marden. Um, Dr Marden had uh, raised a couple of issues about evidence which is up on the website. Um, it's just for clarification, she's identified issues in paragraph 2 of the SPICE report and in paragraph 3 uh, which she considers to be inaccurate. It's just to put on record that the, the SPICE report was produced at the outset of the petition and obviously information has come to light to us uh, since the petition was brought forward means that that information is now updated doesn't change the original um, SPICE report, but we are aware that the two issues that she's raised about um, the, the range of conditions and also on inpatient homeopathic beds, which she considers is inaccurate, we know that they're inaccurate and we can take that on board in our considerations. Um, but that doesn't change the information that we have. Um, I have to say, I, I'd, maybe because I wasn't uh, in the committee at the time that this first came out, but I have been involved in discussions with uh, local people who have received support from this service and I, I would like to make a request to the committee that we actually invite some of the health boards that are making these decisions to come and speak to us. Um, I'm told that the waiting lists for these types of services are, are now going through the roof. Um, there are real concerns about the types of support being given to people with chronic pain issues and I just wonder if we need to actually get representatives of the health boards who are making these decisions not to support um, the, the funding of this uh, integrated care service so that we can get a fuller understanding of just why they've made these decisions. Writing back and forward is obviously it's helpful in getting us some information but I think it's just raising more and more questions. The members agree that we, we try and get a meeting at which the health board could come and speak to us? I'm supportive of that idea to bring the chief executives along, uh, but I think one of the issues we need to make them aware of before they come along is the decisions that have been made not to refer any more patients to the CIC, because clearly in Lanarkshire Health, NHS Lanarkshire, while there is a commitment to continue the treatment of those patients who started treatment prior to the 1st of April 2015, there is no current commitment to make referrals after the 1st of April 2015. So I think the issue about the waiting list that you've raised is one whereby patients can no longer be referred from NHS Lanarkshire, and that might be the same in other health board areas. But clearly for Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, the question is, at the present moment, they're saying they will maintain that service, but how long will they maintain that service? And I think that's the concern from the petitioners and others, as while the, the health board, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, have said they will uh, maintain that commitment, if the other health boards start reducing their reliance on that service, then how long can they maintain that service? Because what NHS Lanarkshire have said, clearly said is they will continue the treatment of those prior to the, the 1st of April 2015, but that will be reviewed if they, they no longer feel they'd require treatment uh, beyond that period. So there is a, an issue there in terms of the sustainability of the CIC, but underlying that is the referral rates uh, or the, the lack of referrals from other health boards. So I think in terms of who do we invite? I mean, there, there have been submissions from Lanarkshire, from Greater Glasgow, from Highland. Is that the health boards that we're talking about? Yeah. That will certainly give us an idea of what's what's going on out there. So if we write to them and ask them if they'd be prepared to come and discuss this issue, and not just in the negative about what they're not doing, but how, what are they going to do to replace um, the services and promote um, more constructively the, 
the, the concerns that, that people have health promotion aspect of it. It's not just about challenging them over their decision, but asking them what they're doing as an, al an alternative. Um, if that's what their decision is, uh, what are they doing to to replace the, the services that they currently uh, no f longer feel they, they want to support? So I think we take that, that forward um, with that request, if members are agreed. Okay. The final petition today is PE1543 by Stephen Salters on investigating parental alienation and reviewing civil legal aid. This petition was originally lodged in November 2014 and was subsequently taken down for legal reasons. Those reasons were that there were outstanding legal proceedings involving the petitioner to which the subject matter of the petition was relevant. The legal proceedings have uh, concluded. The petitioner requested that his petition be published and considered by the committee. And having had sight of the petition and being aware of the outcome of the proceedings involving the petitioner, which have resulted in a non-harassment order being put in place, the committee will consider what action we could take. My suggestion is that we close the petition under Rule 15.7 of Standing Orders on the basis that the outcome of the legal proceedings and the issues involved mean that in this instance it would not be appropriate for the committee to consider this petition further. The members are very agreed. That's agreed. Okay. So I confirm we the, we close that petition, and that means that we go to agenda items four and five, which are to be taken in private session. So I now close the meeting to members of the public. <laughs>